This morning we're going to have a message that's simply called Jealous. The full character of God, I believe, is rarely preached. And even less lived by us. So into the great city of Nineveh, the prophet walked. And he walked under the protection of God. And the year was 760 B.C. Nineveh, this monstrous empire called the Assyrians, whose capital was Nineveh, we can hardly imagine the cruelty and hideousness of the Assyrians. Back through thousands of years, we still talk about them. But in the day, they were greatly, greatly feared. Difficult to even talk about the cruelty and brutality of the Assyrians. Not only would they wall up houses in any village that they would conquer, so the people inside the house would starve to death, die of perishing. But they would make pyramids of human heads. These huge piles of pyramids of just the heads of their enemies. Nineveh, the capital, was famous for its pillars adorned with the skins of their captured, flayed alive. You can imagine the hideousness and horror of what Israel was experiencing being underneath the domain of the Assyrians. So the prophet walked in to the city, and the great prophet Jonah prophesied that the city would certainly fall and be judged for its wickedness and cruelty and brutality. Jonah fully expected the city to be wrathed, judged. But unbeknownst to Jonah, the city repented in sackcloth and ashes from the king all the way down through the servants. They even would not let the cattle feed. The repentance was so great, and God turned his eye away from Nineveh and the Assyrians and did not wrath them. Jonah, of course, extremely depressed and upset because he knew what the Assyrians had done to all the world and certainly to his own people. But God did relent from his judgment. 150 years later, Nineveh had forgotten. And the Assyrians had forgotten that God had pulled his hand back. And they went right back to their cruelty and right back to their butchery and right back to their brutality. And all the sin and oppression of the Assyrians. Now comes another prophet. And this prophet's name was Nahum. And again, Nahum took up the call of God against the Assyrians. But this time, the Assyrians and the capital of Nineveh did not repent and did not turn. Turn with me to Nahum, the first chapter. And this is where we pick up this scathing denunciation of Nineveh with its echo to our nation.
Nineveh. I'll tell you what happened shortly, but let's read from Nahum, the first chapter, starting with verse 2. Let's stand together underneath God's precious and powerful word. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake before him and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who take refuge in him. But an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end to its sight, and he will pursue his enemies into darkness. You may be seated within God's terrible and wonderful word. I want to go through seven aspects, indeed attributes, descriptions of God in this passage we just finished hearing. The first one, he's a jealous God. This is found in verse 2. He desires you, this nation and indeed every nation in the world, for himself. It says in Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It says in Isaiah 42, verse 8, he shares his glory with no man. So God is not going finally and completely, ever going to share his glory with your sin, with your sin nature, with our greed, even our doubt and worry. He desires a bride. Are you part of it? He desires a bride that's not compromised by other lovers. Lovers of the culture's ways and its filthiness. There's an incredible scripture that I like to put up on the screen. It's from Exodus 34, verse 14. It says, For you shall not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now, I know we refer to Jesus or Christ or the Lord, but let's just for a moment use the scripture here and refer to him by His name, which is Jealous. 
Jealous, I fear you. Come on. Jealous, I fear you. Jealous, I love you. Jealous, I respect and am in awe of you. Jealous, I respect and am in awe of you. Jealous, I am yours. Jealous, capital J. Elkanah. Elkanah is the Hebrew spelled E-L, obviously. Second word, Kanah, spelled K-A-N-N-A. And this Hebrew word means consuming fire, God jealous. Consuming fire, God jealous. El Kanah, God jealous. His name is actually jealous. Now we call him the good shepherd. We call him the door. We call him the way, the truth, the life, all these things. But his name is also jealous. He strongly stands, strongly stands against mixture, compromise. Now I believe if you boil down what's happening in this culture, it comes down to three idols. Now, there's obviously smaller idols, there's other things, but three main idols that you as a believer, you as a Christian, are confronting whether or not you realize it. It's coming at us from many sides, but there are three big idols. The first one is abortion. Abortion has divided this nation like nothing else, and we have voted for it as a nation. I call it abortion murder. 50 million murders. The second idol, the second of the big three that we are confronting and it's confronting us is gay pride. Scripture says, I resist the proud. So isn't it interesting that they call themselves gay pride or have gay clubs, pride clubs in the schools? Now here's the deal, and I've already mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. The whole LBGT plus follows the gays. It starts with the men, and it goes like dominoes all the way down. The third is woke perversion. First one's abortion murder. Second one is gay pride. Third is woke perversion. Now, the roots of wokeness are sexual promiscuity. Are you aware of this? Sexual promiscuity, in other words, anything goes, and we need to have the pronouns and all the verbiage that supports the sexual promiscuity. This is even moved into gender fluidity where it's fluid whether or not you're a man or a woman. Woke perversion. So this is not some light little thing that you were trying to get the pronouns correctly on. The roots are evil and dark. And these are the big three that we're dealing with. Many other issues, certainly. But these are the big three that the United States of America is looking to export worldwide, and has been extremely successful at it. Second, and again, these are aspects of God that we're getting out of Nahum, the first chapter. An avenging God is the Lord, it says in verse 2. Now, this is a critical aspect of God that he sees and responds But here's the deal. He responds his way and in his timing, not ours. 
He avenges thoroughly and completely. So the great horse of Alexander the Great walked across the desert land. And unbeknownst to Alexander, his horse was trotting on the top of the dirt that below the horse's hoofs was Nineveh. It was so thoroughly destroyed by the time of 333 B.C. that even Alexander didn't even realize where he was taking his horse across the capital of the greatest city that had existed just centuries before the Assyrians. When God avenges its thorough and its complete. Now here's the deal. You ready? God is both too slow for us <laughs> and he's too terrible for us. He's both. He's too slow and he's too terrible for us. We're quick to say and think, he got away with it. She got away with it. That nasty person that slandered me, that nasty girl or boy or man or woman that was so mean, he got away with it. Oh, really? Oh, really? Uh-uh. He's too slow for us. We want God to, boom, respond now, immediately. But it doesn't work that way. We're always thinking, or the culture certainly does, and you hear this all the time. You hear it from Franklin Graham, from all these guys. Well, God would never, a loving God would never, a loving God wouldn't do such a thing. Really? Say, well, the natural disasters, that's mother nature. It's like there's no father God involved in his earth. Where did I start this? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You don't think he knows what's going on? You cannot assume you understand what a tornado has done. You cannot assume you understand that every life that was affected and the way it was affected to turn people towards him, to cause repentance, to cause awareness that there is a God that lives. I would call us to Father God, not Mother Nature. Third, a wrathful God. It says in the second verse, he reserves wrath for his enemies. You an enemy of God? Fear. You're a friend of God? No fear. Never does the believer ever experience wrath. Now, a believer can see the effects or get the effects of wrath, but the wrath isn't intended ever for a believer, only for God's enemies. But I would quickly say it's coming. It's coming. The wrath reservation of the lake of fire is on its way. My wife and I were talking with our son David last night. Our granddaughter Cassie was there. And David said an interesting phrase. He says, the church has been hesitant to ever really talk about hell. And now look what we've got as a culture. Boy, there's some real truth to that. There's no fear of God. Anything goes. Do whatever you want. And there's no consequences. 
Now, the believer, you're one, right? The believer will be disciplined by the Lord. The believer will be pruned. The believer will be corrected, but not wrathed ever. He reserves wrath for his, come on, you've been reading the scripture, enemies, right. Number four, the Lord is slow to anger. Oh, the great, great patience of God. It's one of his most magnificent attributes, patience. Aren't you glad? <laughs> oh, I'm real glad. God waits, and he waits, and he waits. And I would even take it a step further that God rests. R-E-S-T-S. He rests. He rests and waits for repentance and turning. Long after sin and sinning, God is still convicting, still drawing the lost to himself still asking for a clean heart, still, if you will, commands obedience and brokenness. The Lord desires to withhold his anger, his wrath, until, until, until there is no heart change that will ever come. We gloss over this scripture from Luke 16. Turn with me to it, Luke 16, and we just kind of burn through it, move it along our way, and not really sometimes realizing what's being said in Luke 16. Luke 16, verse 19, and I'd like to read this whole passage. Turn with me to Luke 16, verse 19, and I'll start reading. Now, there was a certain rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor every day. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at the gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now, it came about that the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue. For I'm in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he's being comforted here, and you are in an agony. And besides all this between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Verse 31, last verse. 
And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. What a scripture. Neither will they be persuaded. Say it with me. Neither will they be persuaded. So much of this culture, no matter what you say to them or do in front of them, they're not going to be persuaded from their evil, from their sin, from their parades, from all that they're doing. Doesn't mean you shouldn't live a godly life and certainly speak by your life to them. But there's going to come a time, and indeed it's nigh, when they will not be persuaded in God, will not strive with man, Scripture says, forever. Come to me, come to me, repent, change, turn, brokenness, come to me, come to me. And then it's silent. And then comes number five. Great in power, it says in verse three. Now Nahum the prophet in verses three through six describes 13. Interesting number, 13 aspects of the works of God. And you see them throughout the word. First one is whirlwind. There certainly was a great whirlwind between the Egyptians and Israel separating them. That cloud of fire. Second was storm. Jesus was in the boat and the storm rushed against the boat and Christ rested and slept. The third is clouds. Mount Sinai was covered with clouds, frightening, lightning and thunder and sounds. Fourth is dust. Again, these are all the 13 descriptions of the works of God. Dust. Can you bear this next one? From dust you came, and to dust you will return. You know we're just dust. You don't believe that? (laughs) Check out the one that died 300 years ago. You don't believe that? Check out where you will be 300 years from now. I'm talking about your body. The sea and dried up is the fifth. The Red Sea dried up, and God did this often, where he would not only let Israel pass through on dry land, but he let his prophet Elijah and Elisha walk through the Jordan on dry land. Joshua, dry land. Moses, dry land. All this. He said he dries the rivers. That's number six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Dries the rivers. Elijah prophesied that it wouldn't rain until his command And for three years, no rain until the rivers dried up. It says Carmel wither. You don't think Carmel shook and withered when the fire of God fell at the word and prayer of Elijah on the sacrifice and the stones and the whole mountain, I'm sure, was a fire with the glory of God and these monstrous priests of Baal and Ashereth, who cut themselves and danced and did all this evil. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 are all found, if you can imagine this, in one passage of Scripture. Turn with me to it. Revelation 8. All this happens during the tribulation. 
There was thousands of years between what I've talked about here of the whirlwind all the way up to Carmel. But during the tribulation, it happens. Boom, 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 boom. Revelation 8, starting with verse 5, I'm going to read the whole thing. You ready? Matter of fact, stand with me on this one. And the angel took the censer, in Revelation 8, 5, and he filled it with fire, there it is, of the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Look at all this stuff happening. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them, and the first sounded, and then came hail and fire mixed with blood. You ever seen that before? Mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burnt up. Look at all these things that are happening. A third of the trees were burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures from the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed, and a third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell into a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood, capital W, and a third of the waters became Wormwood. Many, many died from the waters because they were made bitter, and a fourth angel sounded. This is all in the same chapter, actually the same half of a chapter. Fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon. A third of the stars were smitten, so that a third of them might be darkened. Imagine dark sky, dark stars, black stars. The day might not shine for a third of it, the night the same way. And I looked, and there was an angel flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa. Woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet and the three angels that are about to sound. You may be seated. Great power. Number six, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. <laughs> we'll never understand, I believe, in all eternity, we won't fully understand how good God is. As the believer, we're constantly saying, oh, now I know what God was doing. Now I know what God was doing. We're always asking, why? Aren't we? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my loved one? Why is this going on? Why, why, why? I do it. It's not just you. I do it a lot. Eternity will be revealing more and more of the whys. Boy, this word good, when it says the Lord is good, this is worth really looking at, the word good. The Hebrew is tobi, spelled T-O-W-B, tobi. And this word good, ah, oh, it's a beautiful word. Look at all the meanings of this word. It's bountiful, at ease, fair. Glad, loving, pleasant, precious, sweet, joyful, beautiful. Well, that's worth saying again. This one word, good, it, it means bountiful, at ease, fair, glad, loving, pleasant, precious, sweet, joyful, and beautiful. The Lord is all of this. I just want to be near good, <laughs> don't you? Just to be near good. You know what I'm saying, right? Just to be near what's fair, just to be near the Lord. He's pleasant. He's precious. He's at ease. Oh, do I need that, <laughs> to be at ease, to be resting. Seventh and last one, and I'll close with this one 
It says in verse 7 that he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. Boy, we've got trouble. And the fact that we have trouble right now, whether it be the massive rise of crime or selfishness or the new China COVID that's roaring across China, They're estimating 60,000 have died this week in China from this new COVID spreading worldwide. All these things, the fact that trouble is here, that means stronghold is here. Your stronghold, my stronghold. I have a guy that works insurance. I've known him for years. He's 88 now, and he says life has changed so much in the last couple of years. He says there's so much crime. He lives in Tennessee. (laughs) Tennessee, he says there's so much crime in his little town. He says he's scared to go to his front door and answer it without his shotgun. He said it's so bad. A stronghold in the day of trouble. Again, let's look at the word stronghold in the Hebrew. Maoz, spelled M-A-O-W-Z. And it means fortified place. I like that. Rock, fort, strength. The Lord is our rock. The Lord is our strength. The Lord is our fortified place. Don't be looking for anything to be your fortified place except the Lord alone. We were in Masada, down by the Dead Sea, and that was their fort. When the whole rebellion happened in 70 AD and the zealots hold out in Masada, But ultimately, it fell. And they all died, with the exception of just a few. They died by mostly by suicide. As every father killed his own family. And then the ten remaining men killed each other down to one. My wife and I were on the top of the World Trade Center. It swayed 40 feet each direction. I don't know if you knew this. Slowly swayed. They they had made it so that it would bend and be able to, through the engineers, had been able to withstand all the currents of the wind from this massive, incredible fortress. And America was so proud of the World Trade Center And strong it was and representative it was of America's power and wealth and prestige worldwide until September 11th, 2001. I was at Promise Keepers undergoing my last interview that morning to be vice president. My wife and I were on the top of the Eiffel Tower in France. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the wind up there is ridiculous. You're high up and it, there's no structure to protect you. It's all just this iron and the wind just roars through the Eiffel Tower up there and it just is blowing and blowing. I'm going to say the obvious. The Lord never fails. He's solid. He's complete. He's a rock. He's a strength. He's a fortress. So let me conclude. The Lord, his name is Jealous. Jealous, protect me. Jealous, be near me. Jealous is my God. Jealous is the Lord. Secondly, he's an avenging God. He does not forget. Hmm. Third, he's a God of wrath. Fourth, he's slow to anger. 
He'll wait and wait and wait, looking for broken heart and repentance. Come to me, repent, and then the silence. He's great in power. He's good. The depth of the goodness of God will be exploring it in eternity forever, and he is a stronghold for you and for me. Believer, stand with me. Let's pray together. Jealous, be near us. Jealous, you are our God. Jealous, we honor and fear and love you. Jealous, we are yours and yours alone. Lord, we do pray for our nation. Not so much that this nation would turn because we believe in many ways we're past that, but we are praying for multitudes of individuals that will turn to God, the jealous one. And Lord, we trust you for the morrow that in the day of trouble you are near, our fortress, our rock, our place of stability. It's in your name, jealous Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. God keep you.